and I was on mute. Uh, so hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the global online meetup uh, for Rancho Desktop today. So um, this is uh, going to be a very special edition of uh, the global online meetup because it's been quite a while since we caught up with the Rancho Desktop team. I believe the last edition that we had of this was um, last year. So um, it's it's been a while since we caught up with them and also that, you know, there have been quite a few um, new enhancements come our way since the last edition. So I'm really excited to actually get on with the show and bring our co-hosts on. But before that, I would um, want to set some context around how uh, the global online meetups are conducted in case someone's new here. So first up, um, uh, we would expect that um, you all have questions uh, because, you know, this is a um, session for sharing knowledge. And uh, what um, we want you to do is to leave them on chat. Uh, during the course of the session or during the course of um, the presentation, I will try to relay them to the uh, presenters as and when possible. But if not, please be rest assured that we will be having some um, time reserved for Q&A towards the end. So um, if there are any um, you know, questions that you have, uh, please leave them on the chat. Second thing is that um, while you're interacting with uh, the audience um, that is there alongside you tuning into the meetup and with the uh, presenters, we request that you be as courteous and, um, you know, um, as nice as possible um, because we're all here to learn and we're all here to share knowledge. So uh, those are just the two housekeeping items that are there. Uh, but um, I know that... Uh, you know, this has been something that's been very, very anticipated one, so to say, um, in terms of the meetup. So I'm going to bring on our presenters without further ado and have them introduce themselves. So hi, Mark, and hi, Jan. How are you all doing today? Good. You? <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much for taking out the time today and for um, sort of, uh, you know, making the time to come and uh, talk to us about the latest uh, ongoings in the Rancho desktop world. So um, I think we have a couple of demos as well as some slides to get through. So I'm not going to hold you all back. Um, uh, Jan, do you want to get started with it right away or uh, do you want to do some further context setting before we dive right in? There's like an agenda slide that we have, so we can just um, maybe go to that one and talk. Oh, so yeah, right. Okay. All right. <laughs> so the agenda slide. So I'll start with a um, quick overview of what is Rancher Desktop for those who have um, who are new to this. Um, then I'll give a brief uh, summary of what we talked about in the last um, meetup, just so everybody can get up to date. And then we had four releases since then, 110 to 113. I'll highlight the two to three uh, main um, improvements in each one of them. We'll do a big uh, deeper dive into snapshots uh, where Mark will show a demo how they work. And the other topic um, that is new in our 1.13 release from last month is WebAssembly. We'll talk a little bit about that as well and have another demo from Mark. Then we'll wrap this up by talking about what's on our mind for the rest of 2024, what we think we'll be concentrating on, and then we have time for question and answers. So I think the first section will just take about half an hour or so. So we should have plenty of time for questions and for feedback, suggestions, whatever, keep it coming. So what is Rancher Desktop? It's a developer tool to run containers on your desktop. It's not meant for production. It's to improve productivity of the individual developer in developing new um, applications. Um, it's designed, obviously, for the individual user, for the developer, but we do have some 
enterprise features to help you roll it out to a larger number of users and have it uh, pre-configured or restricted or whatever. Like everything SUSE does, it's free and open source software. So you can look at it, um, you can change it, you can build it yourself. It's awesome. It runs on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, which is probably 99% of all developer um, desktops. Originally, it was um, envisioned as a pure GUI application, but we've implemented a REST API to it and also have a <coughs> command line tool. And both the GUI and the command line go through the same REST API. So there's um, plenty of ways you can automate this if you want to use it in CI or other context. We are probably the biggest users of this um, API ourselves because all our integration tests all make use of this. So we can do a lot of automated testing with it without going through the user interface. And Rancher Desktop comes uh, batteries included. So you have all the command line utilities that you need to develop and uh, deploy container applications, both Docker, Nerdy Control, Cube Control, Helm. <clears throat> so we support two container runtimes, both Container D and Docker D. It's your choice um, what you want to run. We have the CLIs for both of them. And you can run Kubernetes using uh, K3S on either of them as well. And we support Kubernetes versions all the way back from 1.16 to the latest. They all work with Rancher Desktop. Yeah, as Divya mentioned, our last meetup was last year. It's about nine months ago, just after our 1.9 release. What we talked about back then was the at then uh, brand new support for Docker desktop extensions. It's uh, these third party uh, containers that you can install into the GUI and extend the functionality with um, applications added by others. The other feature was that we finally had a preferences user interface for our experimental settings. So you could control all these, enable, disable them from within the app and didn't have to use the CLI to do this. We gave a preview of deployment profiles. This is what I mentioned earlier. We have support for enterprise deployments. It allows administrators to centrally um, um, define both default settings and also lockdown settings, like say you can only download um, container images from the internal registry or something like this. And it's been used by several enterprises for big rollouts. So I just had a call last month from a company where they have added Rancher Desktop to their internal self-service um, portal and uh, deploy profiles to install them. and. After, I think it was just two weeks, they had over 6,000 installs of macOS and almost 500 on Windows. And <clears throat> they said it's all going very smooth. They didn't have any problems, just wanted to let me know about the numbers because they were even higher than they expected themselves. So, of course, we're very happy to hear that the code that we implement is actually working for users. The other thing that we previewed was the new network tunneling feature for Windows uh, to bring it up to par with what we have for networking on Mac OS. On Windows previously, networking always originated from inside the VM and so had problems with mostly with VPN connections inside the companies because you would have to configure <coughs> the VP DNS also inside the the VM with the new networking stack, the connections are tunneled to the host. So we bypass the firewall between WSL2 and the host. And we also do DNS resolution on the host. So whatever you configure for your VPN is automatically visible to Rancher Desktop. So this works automatically. Since then we had 10, uh, sorry, 10. We had four more releases. Um, the first one being 1.10 where uh, the deployment profiles that I just talked about um, went live. We had an implementation of the no proxy list. So this is another thing that uh, I want to point out, the whole proxy support 
for Windows and Rancher Desktop has been contributed by a third party uh, developer. So it's not been done by SUSE. It's somebody else who said, okay, this is not working for me. Um, here's how I would like to work, submitted PRs, discussed it with us, and uh, we merged it in. So the advantage of being open source. In 1.11, we have support for snapshots, which is also a feature that resulted from a discussion with an enterprise user. We'll talk a little bit more about snapshots on the next slide, so I'm going to continue here. We have a container dashboard now, <coughs> which shows you the containers that are running um, on your desktop. Um, you can start them, stop them delete them. So it's still a little bit bare bones, but at least now you have a, a GUI representation of the running containers. And we released the new networking tunneling um, stack that we talked about in the previous meetup. So in 1.12, we said this is no longer experimental. We are confident in what we have so far. It's not yet feature complete. So um, we don't have feature parity with the old networking stack on Windows. This is something that we hope to achieve in the 1.14 uh, release. Then we will make the new networking tunnel um, the default. And then in the following releases, 1.15 or 1.16, uh, the old code will be uh, removed so that we can clean up the internals and only have a single implementation there. Um, the other feature in 1.12 is that we finally got uh, native support for Mac OS um, ARM binaries. So you no longer have to use Rosetta to run the application. There's just one piece left. Um, it's cube control that is not available as ARM binaries for the old version. So for those, you would still need Rosetta, but everything else is completely native now. In 1.13, we added experimental support for WebAssembly. Um, we also have a separate slide on this uh, later. That was a very hot topic at KubeCon last month in Paris. Um, so we'll talk about this some more. Then there's a completely trivial um, enhancement is the cluster dashboard button. So many people did not know that we actually have a Kubernetes dashboard included in Rancher Desktop because it's only available through the notification icon. There's a menu entry in there that says um, cluster dashboard. So if you never stumble over this, you don't notice this. So we just put a big fat button on the left uh, hand side of the window uh, to launch it. It's exactly the same functionality. So it's just a button, but at least you can see it easier. So QEMU 8.2.1 was released, um, which finally made um, it compatible with Apple's M3 architecture. So this works again uh, on M3s, or not again, it never worked before with QEMU, but we had support with Apple's virtualization uh, framework, the VZ um, mode. And we have um, support for Kubernetes and Docker, again, on Mac OS and Linux. <coughs> There was a problem before with C groups um, that has been resolved. Unfortunately, on Windows, there's still some other hiccups, so it's still not working on Windows, but it works on Mac OS now. So snapshots, as I mentioned before, it, the idea came from a meeting we had with an enterprise customer of Rancher Manager, and they talked about us that the development team does the, the agile thing. So they have stories they work on. And every time they pick a new story, they have to set up their whole environment again. They have to install the database, fill data into the database, uh, install the messaging queue thing, install the application. So it took them like half an hour just to set up the machine to work on the next story. And we showed them how you can improve this a little bit by scripting it with our API. But still, it takes the time to, to do the setup every time. So we, we got this idea that you should be able to take a snapshot of Rancher Desktop with the whole VM, everything that's deployed, all your settings, all your workloads. And then you can re 
recover from, um, restore it from this uh, snapshot. And I've listed a couple other use cases and they are all based on real user feedback. So I, this one user said, I like Rancher Desktop. It works almost exactly how I want it, but I really don't like traffic. I want to use Nginx for my ingress control. And every time I do a Kubernetes reset, it's back to traffic. So with snapshots, now they can configure Nginx and instead of doing the reset, they can just restore the snapshot and then they have their own default configuration back. And just yesterday, I talked to another user who does some AI work with it. And they said they have, their application has like lots of big images um, that they need to install. And then the, the uh, model to download and install, it's a lot of setup work. And to reset it back to the starting um, condition takes a lot of bandwidth for for um, working from home to always recover. And you can do some of this with using private registries in your home lab, et cetera. But this is obviously something that snapshots also help by just taking a snapshots with your setup and you can always go back to it. Other, other examples are if your application needs to switch a database schema and you need to develop migrations from the old one to the new one. You test the migration, there's a bug in it. Your data is garbled. You need to fix your migration and start over again. It's great to have a snapshot from the before state so you can just run the fixed migration and see if it now works. And finally, as I mentioned, we support all the Kubernetes versions. So if you have an application that runs currently some somewhere on say 1.25 and you want to see, does it still work on 1.30? Is there API deprecations that get in the way? You can test this also with Rancher Desktop. You upgrade, you see if something fails, you fix it, you restore the snapshot and you do it again. And snapshots work especially well on systems that have uh, copy on write file system semantics like the Apple file system on Mac OS um, using clone file on Linux with ButterFX on XFS, you can do a ref link copy where you really just copy the metadata and the snapshot and the original VM both point to the same data. So you also don't use up additional disk space at first when you do the copy. So it just takes like a second. You still have to shut down the VM to take the snapshot and bring it back up. So it takes still like a few minutes uh, to do it, but it's um, very efficient to do that. So Mark has a demo for this that he can play now maybe. Sure, uh, I actually have it all pre-recorded for 10 reasons, but I'll play that now. Yeah, just a second. Um... All right, we're going to be showing an example of using snapshots. While snapshots are more useful for restoring complex setup and switching between tasks, it is more visually interesting to demo by simply deploying something, deleting it, and restoring it. So we'll do that instead. Here I have already deployed WordPress and have a simple post visible. We can see that we have some Kubernetes containers for it. We can start by creating a new snapshot. As you can see here, this is a pre-recorded demo to avoid spending a lot of time waiting for things to happen. We can change the snapshot name as well as apply a description so we can have notes about what is contained in the snapshot. Also note that snapshots are still somewhat experimental. Creating the snapshot itself can take some time as we need to shut down Richard desktop in order to get it to a consistent point. This does mean that snapshots are not useful if you want to capture live things. For example, an in-memory only Redis database. Once we have the snapshot created, we can check that we still have our containers running. Here I reset Kubernetes as an example of something that would blow away my data. We can see that as I reload WordPress, it is no longer available. We can then restore the snapshot.
we see that the container is back after the restore. Um, so um, if we don't have any questions currently, so do we want to head back to the presentation right now or are we uh, due to demo something else? No, let, let's go back to the presentation, then we do the web assembly thing and then we yep. just do all the questions, answers, stuff at the end, I think, if you, don't, if you don't have anything yet. Yeah, we don't have anything yet, but yeah. Uh, we can go ahead with the web assembly or, uh, you know, technicalities, because I'm sure a lot of people here are interested in that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I noticed Mark was running the demo on a very slow machine. I was just watching the timestamp there in the bottom to start up the VM. That's kind of takes twice, that took twice as long as I, I'm used to it. So I'm, I'm glad that he took a recording and we didn't have to sit through those minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's unfortunate that uh, there is no copy on write on Windows. So on Windows, um, creating a snapshot is kind of slowish because we have to export the whole file system as a tarball, and it also, of course, takes then extra disk space to to store the compressed copy at that time. So, but if anybody has any ideas how to do copy on write on Windows, that would be great. But it's it's complicated also with WSL because it, all the distros are running inside a single VM. So you need to, maybe it's getting too technical. Let's skip to WebAssembly instead. Uh, yeah, and just before we go ahead to WebAssembly, we have our first question from Jim. Um, uh, he's asked whether a snapshot can be copied between uh, operating systems, example, between Mac and Linux. Um, technically, this would work, but we don't provide any mechanisms to it. So it's the way it's stored. It's not really. Um, there's no export import mechanism. If you would just go in there and copy the directory over where snapshot is and plop it into the snapshot directory on the other machine. I'm pretty sure it's just going to work, um, but only between Mac OS and Linux. So since Windows, as I explained, needs uh, to use a tarball of the exported file system, it's completely different. Also, the, the VM is different on Windows compared to uh, Mac and Linux. So Mac and Linux use the same um, mechanism. They use Lima to manage the VM, and they use the same ISO to run uh, Linux inside. So I think they should be portable, but we don't have a mechanism to, to do this. So you kind of have to get your hands dirty and dig into the file system there. So this is one of the things where I normally say, okay, if you break it, you own all the pieces, right? So All right. I think that pretty much answers the question, Jim. If there are any follow-up questions, to uh, leave them on the chat, and we'll get to them uh, during the course of the presentation. But I think, uh, yeah, we can move ahead to WebAssembly now, uh, Jan, and uh, you know we can talk more about our uh, integration in the latest release. Yes, of course. So WebAssembly, as I mentioned, was a hot topic at KubeCon. Um, last month because of the uh, also the release of SpinCube, a new operator that makes it very easy to work with uh, WebAssembly and Kubernetes. But to um, take a step back, WebAssembly is a technology, um, it's a bytecode machine similar to uh, the Java VM or the .NET runtime. So you have an, an abstract portable bytecode that is then uh, just in time compiled on the target machine for the specific architecture. So you don't generate different um, assets for Intel and for ARM CPUs for 32-bit, for 64-bit, et cetera. You just have one single asset that runs everywhere. And it's originally meant to optimize uh, performance in the browser. So it's 
technology that runs in a browser sandbox. Think of one sandbox per browser tab. So it provides um, a lot of extra security. The, the model for WebAssembly is um, slightly different from a regular CPU architecture. So it has separate memory pools for code and for data. So there's no way in WebAssembly that you can have a pointer, um, a data pointer that points into code to modify the code. They are completely separate uh, storage areas and there's no there are no instructions to modify uh, one from the other. So while it's originally uh, done for JavaScript, there are a lot of compiler backends now for C, C++, C Sharp, Rust, Go, Python, that all can uh, optionally create a WebAssembly as their output instead of a native binary. So that means you can run <coughs> write code for the browser um, in any of these languages and it executes there. But Wasm, the Wasm runtime can also be run in a container. So obviously you can directly put the runtime into a container itself, but that's kind of double wrapping, running a sandbox inside a container managed by the uh, container engine. So what you can do for Wasm actually, um, you can have a little shim component um, so that the container engine talks directly through the shim with the WASM runtime. And then you just run the WebAssembly code in this um, sandbox. So you have um, a lot less overhead. And it's also, you don't have a Linux container. There's no shell running in the container. There's no Linux API in the container. It's just the WebAssembly um, itself that's um, running. So that the attack surface is also a lot less. So it's it has better security and it has also um, a lot smaller images. So WebAssembly images are typically just a, a couple megabytes. So, so if you look at others, if you have like a Python uh, container that starts off with over 350 megabytes before you even add your own application to it. Um, and yeah, so that there's, there are a lot of advantages to using WebAssembly and that's I think the reason why everybody is excited to it, it's what's not to like, smaller size, faster speed, better security, greater portability, it's all upsides. So for Kubernetes, it's possible to define a custom runtime class that tells it to tell the container runtime to use this specific shim instead of the regular run C uh, container runtime. And, um, yeah, it's in in our 1.13 release, we have initial support for this. So what we added is we bundle one specific uh, runtime for this for spin. It's just one of a whole set of it. So to me, it's a little bit like a wild west there. It feels like every time there's a new startup, they come up with their own uh, WASM runtime. And um, so there are like seven or eight popular ones right now. We only bundle one in this first version and it's automatically installed and configured. You only have a checkbox. Actually, I'm probably taking away from Mark's demo. Let's look, look at Mark's demo first before I um, repeat all this. I haven't seen this demo either yet. I know it's pre-recorded, but so let's yeah. First. I shall bring it up then um, so that both of us can see it. This is pretty new. So let's just uh, dive right into it with the recorded demo. Here we will do a quick run through of Richard Desktop supporting Wasm containers. For this one, we will mostly be following the tutorial in our documentation. We already have Richard Desktop started with the experimental WebAssembly support enabled. We also have all the sources ready, including the spin paraphernalia and the source for the actual server in this case, returning Go. We can then compile the server via spin. Now that we have compiled it, we can package it up into an image via the normal build process. We can then deploy this image, for example, as a Kubernetes pod. We can then create a service for the pod via kubectl expose. 
Now that everything is deployed, we can access it via kubectl APIs. This is just to show that this is all done via Kubernetes. The normal way of exposing ports on pods will also work. Obviously, this doesn't really do anything interesting. This is just another quick demo to show that it works. As mentioned by Jan earlier, this is mostly useful for limiting the things that can be done by the container simply because there is a smaller API service. All right. Yeah, so what Mark was shown is just running WebAssembly. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. It doesn't make sense. Let's strike that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so what I wanted to mention is that there's now a Kubernetes operator called SpinCube that um, makes it easier to deploy WebAssembly um, to Kubernetes. So you, you just create the app and then you just push one app definition to it and it creates deployments and everything for you automatically. Um, so this is something that um, we're working on right now. So this. This will be also directly supported by Rancher Desktop in 1.14. Um, you'll just have another checkbox under um, Kubernetes where it says install spin operator. It will install cert manager, spin operator, all the CRDs that are required and bundle the, um, the spin CLI component as well. So yeah, just, just a second. I just also had to um, say this. Um, so one of the things that um, I'm personally going to be doing is uh, demoing the spin cube thingy that uh, Nuno has written the blog for, right? Uh, Nuno from uh, Susa again. He's a technical writer. He's also on the live stream. So hi, Nuno. Um, he's also written a fantastic blog for this on how to incorporate uh, spin cube on top of Rancher Desktop. Um, and um, that will be linked in the comments. But I'm also going to be demoing this uh, in an upcoming live stream with the Fermion folks um, at the end of the month. That's on 30th April. Um, so if you're interested in learning how to do it manually, that's that's one of the ways that you can check out. Uh, but um, if you can't wait till then, Nuno has written a fantastic blog for that. So huge shout out. And I'll link that in the description section so you can check that out as well. But of course, we have it coming in 1.14 as like a good checkbox so that you can you do not have to follow the hard way that we do. So yeah. Thank you for entertaining me for that bit. But yeah, go ahead, Jan. No, of, of course. But yeah, we, we do want to make it as easy as possible to just concentrate on your application and not on the scaffolding that's necessary there. So um, this should cut out like half of what Nuno has written in this tutorial to just check the box and go forward. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. What? What? are we going to do for the rest of the year or what what are we planning to do um so and this already started um like at the beginning of the year or in december already um we used to spend a lot of time on manual testing each release and people are probably not not even aware of it so but at like the 1.9 time frame we had like six people spending two days running through a huge list of manual tests before we did the release. And that's 12, 12 work days essentially for one release. We've cut this down with um, automated integration tests using the REST API, et cetera. So for the last release, we had just three people spending one day. So it's just a quarter of the effort, but it's still too much. So we want to automate even more of these um, manual tests. And, and this is what we've been um, spending a lot of time on instead of working on, on features or bug fixes. So and bug fixes is the next thing. We have often prioritized adding new functionality um, to the project over addressing bugs. We have a, a backlog of 1,100 open issues. I think maybe half of them have been filed by the team itself. And I think 
less than half of it are actually bugs. A lot of them are just enhancement requests or ideas, etc. But it's still it's getting unwieldy. We need to draw this down. And there's some um, somewhat embarrassing bugs that have been open for a long time. So we want to spend the time to go through these and address these um, instead of working on additional features. Um, so, so another thing is, if you've used Granger Desktop, you've probably seen we have one page called Diagnostics. So we spent um, a lot of effort to get this in there. You, we can have automated diagnostics that um, see if something does not work right and show you the diagnostic, can give you a link to um, how you can fix it. But then we actually didn't implement most of the diagnostics that we were planning for. There's only like a handful or two handful of diagnostics in there and we have ideas for plenty more, but they never got implemented. So we want to do this um, because the best thing is if something is wrong is, as a user, you see the red check engine light there, the badge on diagnostic that says there's two diagnostics. So you go on the page, it tells you what's wrong. It tells you how to fix it. So you don't have to go to to the Slack channel to ask for help or file a GitHub issue, you get it fixed right away by yourself, um, less frustration. So this is something we want to spend additional time on. Documentation, I think it's fine as it is, but we can always use more tutorials, more how-tos, how to use different technologies with Rancher Desktop, even things like um, Ingress, a lot of people are not that familiar with traffic, so I think we should have more tutorials to show different um, sample configurations, how you configure them with traffic, how they work properly. Um, we're going to expand uh, WebAssembly support. I just mentioned this. Uh, the spin operator will be uh, supported in the next version. The code is almost done for this. Uh, we want to, of course, support more runtimes than just spin. Uh, the problem is things are getting quickly um, very big. So we don't want to add 200, 300 megabytes to the download size of Rancher Desktop just for WebAssembly support that probably like 80% of the users, if not more, don't need at the time. So we, we want to figure out how to download it on demand as a separate pack. And then we probably even move spin and spin operator and spin chimps into that as well. And then the first time you enable WebAssembly support, it just downloads it, just like we download uh, Kubernetes on demand because we support like 180 different versions of Kubernetes, so we couldn't bundle them all. Um, and then we, we will, of course, continue to have some smaller features. So I hope that each release can have like one small feature included there. So it's not just the internal um, housekeeping and improvements there, um, but we have to see what, what it is. So one thing I was thinking of is maybe we want to put engine X as an alternative in there as an option or m multiple ingress options or whatever. But I, I don't want to say right now because we are not sure what we can do and what the priorities are going to be. So um, feedback is always possible. So if you you lobby us, if you put a lot of reactions on the GitHub issue that puts them higher on our radar, but for at least the rest of this year, we will prioritize smaller features over larger features. And I think that's all I have. So now it would be questions, feedback, suggestions. Um, one of the things that I think Nuno has mentioned um, is that um, for the snapshot question that we were discussing earlier, uh, there apparently is the WSL export uh, mydistro.tar um, uh, this this particular comment that I'm just going to throw up here on the screen. Um, but um, yeah, apparently this was a workaround or sort of that uh, for the question that was asked um, with relation to exporting snapshots between operating systems. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so 
No, no, it's on our internal Slack. So yeah, I, yeah, just shoot us a message there so it doesn't get lost. Yeah, and um, uh, also he just did a quick test. It seems uh, thirteen seconds for uh, dot R and uh, two seconds for uh, the VHDX format, but. Uh, uh, that that is live testing that's going on right now <laughs> behind the scenes. Yeah, uh, and it's very dependent on the machine, right? Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, that the demo machine that Mark used was very slow to bring up uh, Rancher Desktop. Yeah. There's other machines that are faster. Some people are lucky to have powerful machines for work. Others are less lucky. I'm lucky to have slow machines so I can test what it looks like on a slow machine. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mark, for taking one for the team. <laughs> um, any, um, um, so one of the things that you mentioned is, um, you know, soliciting feedback and um, reaching out to the, you know, rancher, uh, rancher desktop team. How can we do that? One, obviously, is the rancher um, Slack, that is the rancher user Slack that we have. Um, and I know that we also take a lot of feedback via issues. Um, are there any other means that you uh, want to talk about? Or are these the two specific um, areas that we solicit? These are the two main main channels for this. And um, so Slack is good if you have an issue. There are lots of, I think we have like 3,500 people subscribe to it. Of course, a lot of people subscribe to it and don't log in anymore. But there are always people on there. And there are other users that can help uh, you with it. There's like the company that I mentioned earlier that just installed 6,000 Mac OS uh, machines with Rancher Desktop. I know the person responsible for that is also on that Slack channel. So you, you have some uh, experienced users and not just the developers on there. But if it's um, a bug that is not resolved in the discussion there, or if it's a feature request, it should move to uh, GitHub issues. Because once things scroll off and are more than a week away in Slack, nobody ever revisits them. And it's also, um, don't just create links to Slack. It's a public Slack um, instance. So everything older than three months is no longer accessible. So things just expire in there. Yeah. So yeah, put put it into GitHub issues, but um, yeah, we we will try to shrink our GitHub issues. So don't put frivolous <laughs> ideas yeah. in there. But yeah. Um, another thing that I wanted to give a shout out to is um, we truly do embody um, the fact that uh, you know we use our products at you know, ourselves as well. So for all the courses that um, are there on Rancher Academy right now, most of them leverage Rancher Desktop as like the underlying local um, driver for, um, you know, installing uh, even just Rancher, just like Rancher Manager is on Rancher Desktop. Um, the RK2 course is also, uh, not RK2 course, the K3S course is also built on Rancher Desktop. Um, a bunch of other courses that we have built are on Rancher Desktop as well. So we truly do believe in the fact that, you know, we eat our own dog food before, uh, um, you know, publicizing about it and we open. So it's truly a great thing. And um, um another thing that i wanted to draw attention to is the fact that um we also have a couple of uh tutorials um that um show you how to install uh web assembly workloads like obviously the one that mark showed is going to be up um as a recording after the live stream gets over but we also have um other youtube videos around this so if you subscribe to the channel you should be able to see those as well so those were the two PSAs that I had in case, you know, people were not aware of it and people were not notified about it earlier on. So, yeah, I do not see any questions, which means that, Jan, you were really clear and concise in your explanation. Um, so, yeah. So we did a pretty good job, I guess. Okay, last call.
Okay, last last call for any questions that you might have um, to be answered live. Otherwise, we can always take it over uh, Slack, on Slack or on a GitHub issue. Um, we're not pressure, pressurizing you to, you know, ask questions live if you don't have any, but um, it would be nice <laughs> if anybody had any questions um, to, you know, answer live. Okay, then I think uh, we can close it off here. Um, uh, Nuno has some great words around the demos that were presented. So Mark, uh, thank you for all the great demos that you uh, brought up for this uh, session. They were really, really cool. Um, hopefully uh, we um, are able to curate more of those uh, in our um, YouTube list so that more people are aware of uh, what's you know going on with our different projects, but uh, that's pretty much it. And as you can see, the sun has shone really brightly on me right now. <laughs> so um, I think that's a sign for us to uh, close off and uh, get on with the rest of our day. Um, so if you're around at the Open Source Summit, uh, folks, y'all can come around to the SUSU booth to chat more about this. But otherwise, please do catch us on Rancher Slack uh, or on GitHub issues so that um, you know we can continue this conversation off this live stream as well. Uh, but I would be remiss if I did not thank uh, Jan and Mark for taking our time on a Tuesday morning to come and explain uh, the newest features here. So thank you so much. And um, we look forward to seeing you on another live stream soon, hopefully soon. And uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a nice day, everyone, whoever has tuned in. Uh, we'll see you around on another live stream in just a bit. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.